are a few people in the country who haven't used this gateway to the south at some time or another. It was known to generations of rail travellers as Kingsbridge Station. Then they changed the name to Houston Station after Sean Houston, a railway clerk who was a leader of the 1916 rebellion. This station marks the big leap in the evolution of Irish railways, this time into the heart of Hidden Ireland. After the success of the first Irish railways, from Dublin to Dunleary, or Kingstown as it was then, and from Dublin to Belfast, investors were encouraged to provide rail services to where at that time most of the population lived, the far reaches of the country west of Dublin. King's Bridge was built as the Dublin terminus of the Great Southern and Western Railway, whose proprietor's ambition was nothing less than to bring the railway to the entire southwest of the country. In its heyday, the Great Southern would become the biggest railway in Ireland, with the longest length of track, over 1,100 miles, the greatest number of passengers, and, unusually, a good return on the monies invested. Oh, the Great, the great Southern is the giant of, of Irish railways, obviously, but it had a fairly checkered beginning because it was originally floated as a Dublin and Kilkenny scheme back in 1836-1837 when there was a, a, a moderate railway mania. You have a mini railway mania in 1825, a modest one in 1836, and then the railway mania in 1845. Uh, so it, it, after 36-37, it was, the Kilkenny scheme was abandoned. But then in 1843, a coach owner, Peter Purcell, and James Perry, the Quaker railway man, we can say, who had a finger in nearly every railway pie in the south of Ireland, uh, they thought of reviving it. Uh, Kilkenny was the biggest inland town in Ireland, uh, and they thought there were prospects for Dublin and Kilkenny. Perry and Purcell set out to raise funding for their vendor. Happy for them, as with the Dublin to Belfast line, the British government took the view that there were political advantages in promoting a railway to the southwest. Sir Robert Peel has become Prime Minister. And Peel believed very strongly in economic development for Ireland, again, to uh, cement the union. And Peel said, I'll give you, or I'll arrange for, some government help with money, capital, uh, if you go further west, if you, particularly if you go to Tipperary. Tipperary is the most disturbed county in Ireland. We need to bring some economic development, jobs to Tipperary. Uh, so, will you go to Cashel rather than Kilkenny? And they said, how much? Uh, he said, well, we'll give you a substantial amount. Uh, they said, OK. In the event, they then said, well, why Cashel? Why not go even further west to the centre of Tipperary? We'll go to Thurles. So, they head off Dublin to Thurles, uh, intending eventually to go to Cork, I think, but not in the near future. So. Peel then comes up with uh, an amount of money that's about, about a quarter of the total that they would need at that particular stage. Uh, they still can't persuade many Dublin business people to become interested. They, they raise about £170,000 in Dublin, but they need well over a million at this stage. So they then go to London. And in late 43, early 44, there's still reluctance in London to contemplate Irish ventures. And again, Peel comes in and pressurises his, his friend J.B. Boothby of the London and Birmingham Railway, one of the biggest financiers of English railways, to, to do something for Ireland. And Boothby allows himself to be persuaded. He and his family subscribe £150,000 themselves. So the Great Southern could never have got going, but for English money initially. Uh, when it does, of course, the railway mania then begins to break in late 44, 45, and Irish money begins wanting to come into that stage. But at a, over half the shares, in fact, well over half the shares, are held by English people, who now see the Great Southern as a good commercial prospect. And they're not prepared to let go at that stage. At Lucan in January 1845, even as the whisper of famine could be heard in the wings, the first sod was ceremoniously cut by the Duke of Leinster, an event which moved one bystander to say that now he could die happy having seen a duke work like a common workman. In fact, dukes didn't work like common workmen, but thousands of labourers did, and it was they who laid this first stretch of the Great Southern Line. 
150 years later, this track is still used by intercity trains as well as by commuter services to the growing satellite towns around Dublin. An act of parliament was needed to get the line started and the military authorities required a stop here on the Curragh of Kildare where there was a big army base. Certain other stations were stipulated by members of parliament who voted for the bill in towns where they had a commercial interest. In the past, long distance journeys could only be made by horse-drawn coach, leaving travelers at the mercy of the weather as well as thieves and vagabonds. and horses had to be changed many times on the long journey. Before the railway, the South had quite a sophisticated coaching service, set up by an Italian immigrant who'd settled in Conmel, Charles Bianconi. From modest beginnings, by the 1840s, Bianconi had 60 coaches and 900 horses, covering 4,000 miles a day. But with a coach taking only six passengers, and a cramped six at that, the advantage of the railways was clear. Twenty times that number could travel in more comfort on one train, and with plenty of space for luggage. In fact, the two transport systems quickly coalesced. When a second railway under construction in the southwest, the Waterford to Limerick, reached Clonmel, Bianconi's feeder services made a connection to the Great Southern at Carlo by horse-drawn coach. Now it became possible to journey from Waterford to Dublin by a combination of horse and rail. Not only was the railway the wonder of the age, but to attract the class of passenger who could afford it, the livery was sumptuous. First-class carriages were modelled on a well-off merchant's drawing room. But this at a time when Ireland was about to be struck down by the greatest catastrophe for centuries. The Great Southern had reached Carlo in August 1848. A month later, the first complete failure of the potato crop occurred. In a population numbering over eight million, one third were totally dependent on the potato, not just for food, but also to pay rent on a small piece of land to grow it on. Within months, that third of the population was starving. But by now, the railways could provide some men with employment from which they might feed their families. Daniel O'Connell, champion of the Catholic poor, was amongst those who urged speedier passage of railway bills through Parliament to provide work for the starving. However, the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, was a strong advocate of laissez-faire economics, so that when the government introduced famine relief measures, it was strictly on the basis of free market forces. Peel authorized the distribution of grain, but at the current market price, plus 5%. The railways themselves were at the heart of this economic contradiction. In the 19th century, economic thinking was dominated by the notion that reward comes only through effort. The marvel of the railways themselves was seen as a result of the energetic application of new scientific invention to the productive power of the Industrial Revolution. And all, of course, in the service of empire. So the new railways could be used for the relief of the starving Irish, provided the starving Irish were prepared to work for that relief. As emaciated men, women and children wandered the countryside perishing on a diet of nettles and grass, the Earl of Devon, landlord of vast tracts of the southwest, also urged the construction of more railways, saying, if Paddy is fairly put into the right way, he'll be both ready and willing to earn more money and get better food for himself and his family by a more energetic exertion of his bodily powers. The Earl called the famine 
this visitation of providence which may teach us all some useful lessons. For if we profit by them rightly, good may arise out of this present evil. Which provoked the Freeman's Journal to respond that the railways were too important to be controlled by the British Parliament and the indolence and ignorance of strangers. It's true that for many the railway and the work that it offered came too late. But Tipperary suffered less from the famine than other counties because in 1846 and 1847 the construction of the Waterford to Limerick line gave employment to a thousand labouring men. The line was to connect with the Great Southern, which it duly did in July 1848 at Limerick Junction. Getting so far in turbulent times had not been without its price. Work on the railway could now mean the difference between life and death to a family so foremen were sometimes intimidated to give jobs. On the section of the line out of Ballybrophy, three foremen were murdered. The rise of the Young Ireland movement, precursors of the Fenians, meant that the Viceroy of the British administration in Ireland, Lord Clarendon, was under constant threat of assassination. Nevertheless, with a detachment of military, he had been determined to formally commission the line to Limerick Junction an event which had provoked widespread demonstrations at the government's failure to erase the hunger. These were famine years. So a railway job was a very prized job during the famine years, just getting work building the railway. And the, the biggest contractor by far was William Dargan, who was one of the great railway contractors of the 19th century by any standards. Uh, he built several hundred miles of Irish lines. He's a Carlow man, uh, acquired a very high reputation, uh, built the Irish lines much more cheaply than English lines were built. Now, that wasn't solely because of himself. Land was cheaper, uh, labour was cheaper. Uh, nevertheless, the fact that Irish lines were built for about £15,000 a mile on average, compared with over, well, nearly three times that in England, was a key factor in allowing all Irish lines that paid a dividend, uh, and the bulk did, uh, to be relatively prosperous lines by the end of the century. Despite the famine and its attendant political unrest, the Great Southern pressed on. First via Kilmallock, Charleville, and Buttervant to Mallow. Then via Canturk and Mill Street onto Killarney. The Mallow Viaduct crosses the River Blackwater just uh, south of Mallow on the railway line from Dublin to Cork. Uh, it was built as a series of 10 semicircular arches uh, in about the year 1850 by the uh, railway contractor William Dargan. And in the early 1920s, uh, during the, the, the troubled time in the country, uh, one of the military forces involved decided that it would be necessary to cut the communication between uh, Dublin and Cork. It's not quite clear how much of the bridge would have fallen in that explosion. Instead of 10 masonry semicircular arches, it was built as 10 steel girder spans. And it is recorded uh, that the president of the Executive Council, uh, William Cosgrave, actually rode on the footplate of the engine which drew the first train across the bridge in October 1923. Any suggestion that it is as elegant a bridge as the 1850s uh, masonry arch bridge would be uh, hard to sustain. Blackpool, on the outskirts of Cork City, was reached in October 1849. The Great Southern had earned its name, providing a rail link between the capital of the South and Dublin. Later, after tunnelling through rock, the city itself would be reached with a terminus on the quays, 
by the 1850s, the traveling time from Dublin was about six hours, halving the time the journey had previously taken. took a long time to build the tunnel uh, which gives, uh, brings the railway right down to the quayside here in Cork. Um, they developed uh, fairly rapidly during the um, second half of the 19th century and it ended up with Cork having um, six terminal stations, um, a greater number than any other city in Ireland including Dublin. The railways had a remarkable technological impact uh, in Cork. Uh, they stimulated uh, trade, they stimulated movement, and with the development of large uh, steamers, they happened to uh, funnel down most of the emigration that took place in the uh, second half of the 19th century to what was then known as Queenstown, which is now known as Cove, which became the great uh, emigration point uh, from Ireland. Had it not been for the railways, many thousands who would have died could not have made it to the New World. And had it not been for the Industrial Revolution, they might not have had the ships to take them there, or indeed have been able to make a living in newly industrialized America. When emigrants left Queenstown, they boarded the tenders here on the quayside. This belonged to the White Star Line, and its present rotting state is, in a sense, a monument to the thousands of emigrants who would have last set foot on Irish ground on this very jetty. Thousands and thousands of people would have walked along these boards and out onto the tender. Handmade nails are still there, showing how solid the structure was. When emigrants were leaving, the mixture of excitement was also tinged with apprehension because many of them had never seen liners before, they'd never seen such large vessels. And their stories of emigrants refusing to board the tender because they thought that was what they had to go to America in. It's hard to imagine now how, how, dif how difficult a process such as emigration was. They didn't have the benefit, like we do now, of seeing far off countries on television. For them, they'd heard stories, perhaps people had written letters back, perhaps they might have met one or two people who'd emigrated. But for most of them, they really didn't know quite what they were letting themselves in for. And the tragic contradiction is that the new technology of the middle of the 19th century did not enable the feeding of the starving millions at home. The railway cannot develop an economy, can facilitate its development if the other impulses to development are there. And for instance, the butter trade um, improves, increases, uh, livestock trade increases to some extent. But unless there is local indigenous industrial development, the railway cannot do anything else for people. Nevertheless, the railway did have a profound effect on Munster, most visibly in small towns which were suddenly accessible and so were changed. Mm. 
a day's journey by train to a large city, brought tales of music halls and exhibitions, of department stores and political meetings. The train also delivered the new mass-produced magazines and newspapers, which extended country people's knowledge of life from their local area to the whole globe. In that sense, perhaps more than any other, for the communities of the Southwest, the railway opened up the world. Killarney comes to develop largely as a result of the Great Southern and Western going to Killarney, uh, sponsoring the Railway Hotel, uh, sending out thousands upon thousands of brochures and of tourist guides and so on, extolling, as indeed they deserve to be extolled, the, the beauties of Kerry. So uh, it, it opens up the Southwest in that respect, uh, but of course, to a certain extent, it's tourists in and immigrants out. Now it's emigrants back, the cycle of history is reversed. The Cove commuter train disgorges workers from the suburbs to Cork City. Cork station is serviced by a modern version of an old line, just as the country at large is more dependent than ever on the railways to keep its young workforce mobile through the feeder routes of the system back into Kingsbridge and Houston. There are a few transport systems that have stood the test of a century and a half of service. But the trains that today connect Dublin with the southwest run on essentially the same rail network that was constructed as the Great Southern and Western Railway in the middle of the 19th century. In 1850, it took six hours to travel from Kingsbridge to Cork. Today, from Houston, it's two and a half. Of course, there's no longer the thrill of being drawn by a giant steam engine, but there's still the scenery the Curra of Kildare, the Ballyhura Mountains, the Blackwater River. And there's far more comfort and safety than those early travelers would have believed possible. If you'd like to learn more about the history and relevance of the rail system in Ireland, or indeed recapture the magic of this series, the book Ironing the Land is available from bookshops nationwide.